I gotta admit, I thought this would be the most boring topic ever. It's actually really fascinating. With me, Rob Nadelson, a constitutional law expert at the Independence Institute and music buff, I found out. Colorado has a state song. Every state has a state song. Nobody knows what the hell the state song is. Everybody knows that John Denver's Rocky Mountain High is now the second one. Tell me about the first one. Well, the first one is called Where the Columbines Grow. It was written in 1911. It was made the state song in uh, 1915, and it was written, uh, uh, written by a very interesting fellow who has a very interesting story. All right, there we go. We can go home. Who was this guy? Okay. Uh, this guy's a fellow by the name of Arthur Finn. Not Flynn, Finn. And uh, he usually just signed his name A.J. Finn. He was raised in upstate New York, a very poor boy who somehow fi found a way to get a good education. Uh, went to Tufts College, which is now Tufts University in Massachusetts. Was interested in going into education. After some effort, he landed himself a job as an assistant principal in a place he'd never been before, uh, to quote John Denver, <laughs> uh, Central City, Colorado. And uh, he apparently liked Colorado because he uh, decided to stay, had a successful tenure in Central City, went on to become a superintendent of schools in Alamosa, then went to get his uh, PhD at the University of Colorado. His brother, meanwhile, had moved out here and become a professor at the University of Colorado also. And then he, uh, and then A.J. Finn became a Denver uh, school administrator. Right, none of, none he, of this sounds at all musical. It's not musical, but he was a he was a very versatile versatile guy. He played the violin from an early age. He was an amateur poet, and he became a uh, an amateur archaeologist of some note, specializing in particular on the uh, Pueblo Indians of Southwest Colorado. Published. Uh, published nationally on that subject was very well known. All right, get to the song, though. He wrote this in 1905. Did he write it for Colorado, or is it just part of his, his set of songs? Well, apparently it started out as a poem, which he wrote in 1909, actually. And he was coming back from Europe in 1911. He was feeling homesick. For Colorado, mm, which right. we all can understand. That's right, absolutely. And so he wrote the music then using his violin on ship. Uh, and so when he came back, he, he uh, put them together, and uh, uh, people really liked the song, and uh, four years later, it became the Colorado State Song. Now, he lobbied to have his own song be the state song. Yeah, he was one of them, and he was, a, he was by this time a prominent individual. Was there, was there no state song before that? There was no state song before that. Um, what was particularly interesting about this state song, I mean, as you know, John, I spent many years in Montana. And our song in Montana was kind of a, what I call a hip, hip, hooray song. Uh, the, where the Columbines grow is much more subtle than that. The music is more subtle and the words are more subtle. And some of the criticism and some of the neglect, I think, that the song has suffered over the years comes from the fact that the, that the, that the words in particular are not, not well understood. Now, the word Colorado isn't in the song. Yeah, in the original three verses of the song and the chorus, the words Col Colorado are not mentioned, although it's very clear about th the place he's talking about. And the song was dedicated to the Colorado pioneers, the people like Finn himself, who had come from the east to this new place. Nevertheless, he was sensitive to the criticism, and so in 1921, he wrote a fourth verse, which is kind of a stirring verse. F which, Fifteen years after well, um, it was... Uh, in 21, so it, 10 years after he actually wrote the song, okay. and, uh, and uh, six years after it became the state song, he wrote the fourth stanza. But that never really became part of the sheet music. And it does, you know, it, 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 it rests on the rest of the song kind of oddly, sort of like a rat's ca tail on a cat. Right, so we've all, if, you, if anybody knows their college song, you know, all they know is the last verse. Yeah. You know, all I remember is, dear old CU, all right, <laughs> and then you drink. I, I can't remember anything before that. And state songs are very much like that. Uh, That's it's, right. It's, you go and you remember <clears throat> the last. This one is subtle, and it, it has a lyrical content that is, is actually pretty sophisticated. What gets me is that it's an old-fashioned song, and people have tried to, tried to oust this song 
several times, and it has survived several coup attempts to get it out of our, our uh, away from being our state song. Well, yeah, the coup, att the coup attempts have come to naught when the legislature once again hears the state song. When, when, it, were, it's, it's, when it's, were these quite coup pretty. attempts? Well, one, for example, was in 1917. They uh, uh, there was a movement to get rid of the song, and so a group of uh, school kids comes in, led by Finn himself, interestingly enough, and they sing it for the legislature, and the legislature decides to keep the song over th three or four rivals by an overwhelming vote. You know, the, 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 the subtleties in the song, you, you really have to read the Independence Institute paper on the state song to understand them all. Suffice to say, number one, uh, the, the melody is unusually sophisticated for music of that era. That's number one. Number two, the words themselves, uh, you have to know a little bit about the Greek and Roman classics to appreciate it. You also have to understand that the song keeps shifting time perspectives. It starts in the present, it moves to the future, it goes to the past, it comes back to the present. It also is a series of images, auditory images, visual images that keep so flashing this, was, on you. Was this guy just stoned out of his mind when he wrote it? Was this the original Rocky that Mountain was, High? Well, it, this was, of course, before the era of, um, of, of, of marijuana. But I'll give you one other interesting fact about the song. In, in, the, in the second verse, the second stanza, there actually is what appears to be an environmental lament, a lament about the possibility of a future where the environment uh, has, been, has been ravaged. And, of course, that's one of the things it has in common with our other state song, Rocky Mountain High, because there's also an environmental lament in Rocky Mountain High. It's an interesting coincidence, and maybe not entirely a coincidence. So by the time that this was written till it was adopted by the legislature as a state song, uh, how long was that? That was only a few years. It was, it was, only, four, it was only four years. Right, so from writing it to being accepted was four years, yeah. whereas Rocky Mountain High from John Denver was 20, 25 years difference between when he wrote it and made it a hit and then was adopted as 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 a song. Well, there, there, I think there are two explanations for this. One is, you know, Rocky Mountain High was controversial right away. Right. I mean, it, some people thought it was about drugs. Uh, Finn's song was not controversial when it was adopted, it be, and people celebrated it. It became controversial later on when people had other candidates for the state song, and they pointed out that the original three stanzas didn't have the name Colorado right. in it, and they attacked it on that basis. But of, of course, uh, of course, it survived. I also think that um, that uh, where the Columbines grow is a little more singable than Rocky Mountain High, although I, I like both of them. You told me something pretty interesting. That this is something only a law professor would do. You went and checked the statutes. What did you find? The well, state the, law. The, sta the state, okay, very interesting. Number one, while there are two state songs, if you go into Colorado Revised Statutes, the official compilation, you will find that only where the Columbines grow is listed. Rocky Mountain High is not listed. And I think the reason for that is that Rocky Mountain High was adopted by a joint resolution of the legislature in, in 2007. But Where the Columbines Grow was adopted according to an official state law. So by state law, it's uh, where, the, where the Columbines Grow. The other I, thing it's well, interesting. Hey, so let me see if, we got, if yeah. I got this. So Where the Columbines Grow, man, that's the law. You want this? Yeah. That is there. It's it was, not a mere joint it, it resolution. Wasn't, this, wasn't, this wasn't a resolution. Yeah, this is also nice, too. This, was, this is the frickin' law. It's a law. And it also says that the song shall be uh, used meaning sung or played, on all appropriate occasions. So, when we have a state ceremony and they don't play where the Columbines grow, they're actually viol violating, violating the law. The so law. If, they, if they're playing Rocky Mountain High and not this, then they're violating the law. We could sue their asses. <laughs> you could I, sue them. I like this. All right, you, you put all this in, in a great little issue paper. It makes a terrific story. I tell you, why don't we take 30 seconds and listen to it? You said that the first coup attempt uh, Flynn came in with students yeah. and sang the song, and here we are listening to students sing this song. Why don't we take a listen to this tune?
I have to say, John, okay. that's the chorus that is not the, the, the tune of the three verses, and the tune of the three verses is somewhat more interesting. But there's, I think John Denver could have done a better cover of this tune. I don't know. I, John Denver wrote a number of different songs based on states. I think he had, I think he had the goal of getting adopted by West Virginia, Virginia, Colorado, Montana, and also he did a song on Kansas. And he also did a song about Aspen too. Yeah. Yeah. So he was just he was just looking for the right jingle. All right. So now we we know all this, and it's it keeps surviving, and it's over a hundred years old, and it. Does it stay fresh? Is it still a Colorado song? You know, one of the reasons it stays fresh is because of the nature of the melody. And again, you see this more on the verse than on the chorus you just hear. But the, the melody is filled with what we call accidentals or key changes. In other words, when you expect the, the note to land on, or the, the tune to land on a C, it might land on a C sharp instead. You know, when you expect it to, to, to land on a B flat, it might land on a B instead. And so you see this sort of thing. You also have, a, um, I don't want to get too wonky here, but there are, there are types of chords called diminished and augmented chords which serve to color the words. So when you, when you come to the word moonlight in the first verse, that comes on a diminished chord which creates kind of a, uh, an eerie effect the way Beethoven uses, uses diminished chords in Moonlight Sonata. So, um, so the, the way, he, the, way the, the music colors the words makes it very unlike the typical state song, which is kind of like the typical college yeah, song. Now, when I, th when I think of Rocky Mountain High, I, I can only hear John Denver, all right? And what a Colorado character. I love that. Yeah. When, even though he was from Iowa. Even though he's from yeah, Iowa. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're a <laughs> community of transplants. When I hear this, it feels like it could be updated or anyone could sing it, like many standards, because yep. there wasn't no, there was not the original hit that Frank Sinatra had and only he could do it. You know, are there different versions? Is there one version that's better than another? Or is it time, is it time for uh, somebody else to, to take this? I think it's time for somebody else to take it. I mean, the version you heard is, is it's uh, from the internet, it's on YouTube, you can pick that up, but I think it can be sung uh, for, First off, the entire right. song. So another, song. Another, and, in other and, words, and, and we need, we need Hazel Miller or Big Head Todd or somebody else yeah, to we, cover we the need, fort. We need, we Rob, need somebody to do thank it. Thank you. Where the Columbines grow at the Independence Institute. That's independenceinstitute.org. Tell a friend. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. And we'll see you next week.